So I'm standing here in my small Suffolk garden on a slightly sunny morning and I'm really thrilled to be with you all uh, for this conference and what I want to do today is talk a bit about um, how hope is woven into my own environmental writing. Now nature writing is of course um, a very political thing to do and it needs to be political because we're living in an emergency. Climate change and massive biodiversity loss make it very hard to write about the natural world in any other way than what's called declensionist narratives. And that is stories that are about ruination and decline, loss and disaster. But the problem with stories like that, I think, is that they can be paralyzing. And as I say in one of the essays in my book, Vesper Flights, um, we are living in apocalyptic times. But it's helpful to remember that um, the earliest meaning of the word apocalypse is really not the end of things. It's not one final dreadful day. Apocalypse actually means the revelation of things that have always been there, but have only now been brought to light, to brought to our vision and understanding, that only now have been brought to our attention. So like the um, ecologist Aldo Leopold said, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. And my job as a nature writer, I think, is not to hide these wounds. That would be a dangerous lie. My own work tries instead very hard to help lessen the loneliness because loneliness and isolation lead to despair. They're paralyzing forces. And as Rebecca Solnit has pointed out, if we're despairing, we do nothing. If we're blithely unconcerned, we do nothing. We have to open a space in front of us that's full of uncertainty about the future. And it's that space that we can fill with hope. So I try to work against loneliness um, through focusing on love and wonder and the place of attention and devotion in our relationship to the natural world. There is a need for overly polemical writing about nature. But there's also, I think, and hope space and a need for writing like mine, which works to keep open that space of possibility in which we can march and fight, in the words of the poet Aimé Césaire, fight for what we love, not are. So collective action is crucial, of course, and the title essay of my book is about common swifts, and I've always been obsessed with these birds, partly because of their astonishingly aerial habit. Um, I'm sure many of you know that after they leave their nests, common swifts, um, the baby birds, fly continually for two or three years. They never touch the ground, they never land, they just keep flying. They inhabit the sky like herring inhabit the ocean. But it's only very recently I've learned about swifts' vesper flights. And these are these extraordinary precipitous ascents they make every dusk and dawn at nautical twilight. They'll fly thousands of feet up into the sky to reach a certain altitude. And once they're there, they orient themselves. They look at the, the pattern of polarized light in the sky. They look at the disposition of the stars. They can look right out 100, 100 miles or so to see clouds on the horizon. And what they're doing, ornithologists think, when they do this is working out precisely where they are. And when they know where they are, they can work out what they're going to do next. And they work out how to do this by virtue of what's called the many wrongs principle. They average all of their individual assessments in order to reach the best decision about where to go next. They pay attention to the swifts around them in order to work out what to do, and they work out what to do by following one another. And I can't help but see these Vesper flights as um, very hopeful and instructive, and they remind me very much of how we as societies and individuals need to take the time to work out exactly where we are and what is on our horizons. Um, so we know what the best course of action is to take us to the next step. And I think these flights function very much like this conference. They're a congregation of many voices in order to orient ourselves toward the future, expecting difficulty and meeting it with community. So anyway, that was a kind of introduction. Um, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about um, and concentrate on one thing in particular. And it might seem a small thing, but I don't think it is. 
it's um, something I talk about a lot in my writing, and it's a thread that runs through a lot of the essays in my most recent book. It's on how watching animals and paying very close attention to them can be revelatory and can change the world. So, reeling back to very small me, I had a very odd childhood. I didn't come from a posh background, a posh family at all, but um, due to kind of accidents of history and biography, I grew up in a little house in the very corner of a small country estate in the middle of suburban Surrey. The big house that was there had burnt down about a century before, but everything else was still there. Um, so there were meadows and woods, there were terraced gardens and specimen trees and ponds. I mean, it was a really amazing environment to, to grow up in. And I was a solitary, quirky kid, and I was quite a lonely one. But I was also very curious, and my curiosity and loneliness spurred me to spend a lot of time outside searching for creatures. And at home, I used to compulsively read field guides because I wanted to learn the names um, of all the things I found, the same way really that I wanted to know the names of my friends at school. And I think learning names is important. As the much lamented and missed writer Barry Lopez said, you have to know the names to be able to talk about the world. And the more names I knew and the more animals I knew, the more astonishing the world around me became, the bigger the world became. So the meadow, for example, it started off being this kind of fuzzy green space, and, um, but it turned into this wonderland of unimaginable complexity with springtails and spiders and butterflies and voles and complicated assemblages of botanical richness. And the other thing I did back then when I was small was spend a lot of time watching individual animals, everything, you know, rabbits, foxes, woodpeckers, butterflies, grasshoppers, anything I could find. And I watched them with my naked eyes and I watched them through binoculars and I watched them so closely that they kind of filled my consciousness. And I used to try and imagine what it was like to be them, to feel what they felt and to see what they saw. And there are several things that happen when you pay this kind of concentrated attention on a creature. First of all, it can promote a radical form of escape from yourself. This is the magic trick that the philosopher Iris Murdoch called unselfing. And she used this wonderful example of looking at a kestrel hovering outside a window. She said, imagine you're feeling sad and disconsolate and depressed. And then you look out the window and you see this kestrel. You concentrate on it so much, and she uses this wonderful phrase, that the world becomes all kestrel. And when, they, when you return to yourself, you discover that the press of your own difficulties have lessened. And this is a kind of radical empathy, a form of radical empathy, I think, that spurs not only a relationship, a new relationship with yourself, but it instantiates a kind of sense of a common bond with other creatures. And it's precisely that kind of bond, I think, that inspires conservation action. And it's also, I think, very important to think about how these forms of radical empathy with creatures are in principle available to everyone. So much of the way we talk about nature um, implies that you can only really have a kind of full, meaningful, life-enhancing uh, interaction with it if you, for example, go up and you know, climb a mountainside or wander in an old-growth forest. And this, of course, is deeply unhelpful if you're living in a crowded inner city environment or you have limited resources. You can't get out there. It's hugely exclusionary. But anyone can watch a hoverfly in a slanting ray of sunlight or watch a spider crawling over the bricks of an outside wall. And lockdown has been really interesting in helping me think about this. It's made me think of those monks in medieval monasteries who used to make careful notes of the weather and the movement of the stars. And it's reminded me how we don't need to strike out into the wild to feel close to the natural world and receive solace from it. Because from one place, we can witness the sweep and dip of the universe about us. The stars over the monastery gables, the birds on the wire, the wood pigeons that visit this patch of grass behind my house before flying off elsewhere we can become deeply connected to the world by paying the most careful and fearless attention to it, to what we can see from wherever it is we must be. So back to our Kestrel example. 
Very importantly, if you watch a bird or watch a kestrel like that, it reminds you that you can't really know what it's like to be a kestrel. I mean, you can try. You can try and imagine what it's like to see, an ult see ultraviolet light, um, and see everything around you in the most extraordinary visual detail. You can imagine the press of air under your wings or the loose clench of talons as you hover. But you can't know what it's like. I'm going to misquote the philosopher Thomas Nagel here and say, you know, the only way to know what it's like to be a kestrel is to be a kestrel. But the attempt, I think, is crucial. Because it spurs a recognition that the phenomenal world the kestrel lives in is not ours. That's important because it reminds us that the world is not here for us alone. And it's, this is not just one world. We walk among an almost infinite number of what ethologists call Umwelten, that is the life worlds of other creatures. And then if you start thinking about how differently a kestrel sees the world, it reminds you too that what kestrels need from the world is not what we need from the world. So, for example, I think of people who, who think that sort of scruffy grassland is kind of ugly and horrible, and they much prefer close mown grass, like sort of football pitch, much, much, much neater and tidier. But for a kestrel, there's no voles there, there's nothing. It's like, like a desert, a close mown field. So thinking about getting into a kind of act of imaginative empathy with another creature can widen like ripples in a pool into a space of recognition of ecological responsibility. And finally, I think that acts of sustained attention like this make it clear that creatures aren't us. And that seems really obvious, but we see creatures as mirrors of us all the time. We're taught to believe that nature is the one place free of human meaning. And I always think of that quote from the poet Baudelaire that, you know, the greatest trick the devil ever played was convincing us that he didn't exist. Um, my book is all about trying to comprehend the human meanings that we have given the creatures around us and how we use the natural world to validate our own social and con cultural concerns. And it's really good to muse on matters like this because trying to understand why we value certain landscapes and creatures more than others as obvious conservation import. But knowing the meanings we've given animals is also important because if you hold those meanings in your head when you see the animal and push them just a little aside, you can sometimes look past them and see the alien wonderment that is the actual animal in front of you. And the real magic is, sometimes the animals that you look at do that for you. Sometimes an encounter with an animal can be a miracle. So I'm going to end with a story about one of those moments for me. I was walking up this grassy, sun-crisp autumn headland in New Zealand, right at the very edge on the coast of, near Dunedin. And I'd gone to this place waiting for something, to see something, and I didn't know whether I'd see it or whether it would happen at all. It was a very still day which was not good for this particular kind of animal. And the sky was this kind of remote rouged blue. And then the wind came. The wind came suddenly. It was astonishing. And there in front of us, this sort of lump of white sort of started to move, this fluffy white lump of white. Um, it, it sort of raised these stick-like arms and wobbled them. And it was a little bit like a sort of a child in a ghost outfit. And what it was, was a baby albatross. Um, these wings hadn't got feathers yet. Uh, they hadn't flown. And this, this small childlike ghosty thing had been sitting there for a hundred days looking out to sea. It was a really awesome little creature. But that's not what I wanted to see. I wanted to see an adult albatross. So the wind got up and I looked at this baby albatross and I thought about albatrosses. I thought about Theseus's ships and I thought about Baudelaire's albatross and Coleridge's albatross and all the kind of poetic and literary albatrosses that there are. Then I thought about our imperial visions of global exploration and caught up with all this was a biting sense of guilt um, and human guilt about what we're doing to the natural world because these old stories are raised along with the new. And then the wind got stronger and then the albatross came. The albatross came and it was too big to understand. It was like a dog was hanging there in the air. It came in on the wind. It had these long knife-like wings bowed and these webbed feet spread like rudders. It was the most astonishing thing. And as it curved in, it turned its head towards me and it looked at me with these mild Madonna eyes down its long squid-cutting beak. 
and I was absolutely lost for words. Its world was wind and sea and spray and salt and the uplift from the rolling swell of southern oceans and it looked right through all the stories I'd ever been told about the world and the air shivered with its newness. I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to be part of Earth Optimism. Um, being a writer is quite a lonely thing to be. There's a lot of weeping over one's desk and wandering around in woods. And the sense that um, my voice is part of many diverse voices working together to, um, to raise hope and optimism about the way forward is, is a deep thrill to me. And um, you know, I'm, I hope that my little contribution talking about how these small local interactions with wild creatures can open um, possibility for the future. I hope that's um, interesting and, 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 and useful to everyone watching. So thank you very much. <laughs>